Uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here in Brussels to discuss the themes of Scotland, the EU, the referendum and reform. I'd like to start by thanking the European Policy Centre uh, for hosting this event. It's a, a pleasure to speak to such an organisation which provides such excellent EU policy analysis and as ever has attracted a fantastically engaged and varied audience. Um, it's a big privilege for me to be here in Brussels at the institutional heart of Europe at the start of what I believe will be a crucial period in the EU's development. In light of the results of the European Parliament election and the imminent appointment of a, a new College of Commissioners, we are at a point um, at which the EU's priorities are being re-examined, new commitments are being made and a wider and much needed uh, discussion is underway about how to build a stronger, more responsive and more successful Europe. A Europe that meets the aspirations of its citizens. There are of course parallels between the conversations here in Brussels and in Scotland in this respect. We too have uh, arrived at a new juncture in our constitutional journey um, and our aim is to create a stronger and more successful Scotland, a Scotland that meets the aspirations of its citizens. So today I'd like to set out how we've reached this point, what happens next and what does this mean for our partners in the EU. One of the central messages to emerge from the Scottish referendum was the extent to which ordinary citizens across Scotland, many of whom had never voted before, reconnected to a political process and participated actively in a national debate. This was a debate that was not only about how individuals saw the constitutional future, but more importantly, a wide-ranging discussion about the kind of society they wished to live in and what policies they wished their current government to deliver. So how did we get to the referendum? Well, in 2011, the Scottish National Party, standing on a platform <coughs> of independence for Scotland, won a majority of seats in the Scottish Parliament, giving not uh, only the political mandate but the constitutional legitimacy to call for a referendum on Scottish independence. And I'd like to be clear at this point that Scottish nationalism has always been a civic, peaceful, constitutional and wholly democratic movement. The cause of Scottish Home Rule has always been advanced within the government system and constitutional tradition of the UK, compliant at every stage with the rule of law. Our independence referendum was squarely within that tradition, with the Scottish and the UK governments working together to agree a constitutional and binding process, enshrined within a document called the Edinburgh Agreement, signed in October 2012 by David Cameron for the UK government and Alex Salmond for the Scottish government. And the Edinburgh Agreement set out the principles under which the referendum should be held. And the key paragraph of the agreement was paragraph 30 on cooperation. It stated that the UK and Scottish governments would respect the result of the referendum and work together constructively in the light of the outcome, pursuing the best interests of the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Now the referendum, as you know, was held on the 18th of September and 55% voted no and against the proposition that Scotland should become an independent country at this time. The turnout was almost 85% and this equates to just over 3.6 million votes being cast and the referendum having the highest ever turnout of any UK-wide vote, 85% um, turnout. So, in line with its commitment, however disappointed, and of course we were disappointed um, in the result, however disappointed we were, in line with the commitment that we've made in the Edinburgh Agreement, the Scottish Government has accepted the result of the referendum. However, it's clear from polling that not all of the 55% voting no and against independence were voting for the status quo. Indeed, during the referendum campaign, Prime Minister Cameron stated Business as usual is not on the ballot paper. The status quo is gone. The campaign has swept it away. There is no going back to the way things were. A vote for no means real change. Now, the leaders of the UK political parties committed that further substantial devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament will be delivered within a short period of time. This was all uh, stated in the week leading up to the referendum. For example, the Prime Minister said, if we get a no vote, 
that will trigger a major, unprecedented programme of devolution with additional powers for the Scottish Parliament. Danny Alexander, a cabinet member, former Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Liberal Democrats, said effective home rule, but within the security and stability of the United Kingdom. And Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister, said, we're going to be within a year or two as close to a federal state as you can be in a country where one nation is 85% of the population. So not only have the 45% who voted yes quite clearly stated that they wanted substantial powers, but the 55% who voted no were also promised more powers, and I've read you out those quotes from the protagonist involved. Proposals for new powers uh, are to be developed by a commission established after the referendum by the UK government and headed by Lord Smith of Kelvin, uh, comprising representatives of each of the main political parties in Scotland. The process will accumulate in the publication of draft legislation no later than January 2015, a few months hence. Scotland's First Minister, Alex Salmond, has set out three good government criteria by which the Scottish Government will assess proposals on further devolution to Scotland, and these are as follows. Firstly, coherence. So as far as possible, the Scottish Government and Parliament should have a coherent set of powers to tackle a particular problem, rather than leaving some relevant powers in control of one government and others in that of the other. Secondly, effectiveness. The package should provide levers that can be used to address social and economic challenges, not simply a transfer of funding or delivery uh, accountability with little or no practical scope for uh, taking innovative policy decisions to meet the Scottish needs. So coherence and effectiveness. And the third one, transparency. Citizens should know who to hold accountable for decisions. Our First Minister also set out three policy tests against which the Scottish Government will assess proposals for further devolutions. And importantly, these issues were those that the people clearly engaged with during the most energised and participative dem democratic process in Scotland's history. Firstly, the policy powers and policy tests. They should enable us to make Scotland a more prosperous country, in particular genuine job-creating powers are important. Secondly, they should allow us to build a fairer society. We need to address the deep lying causes of inequality within Scottish society. And thirdly, they should enable Scotland to have a stronger and clearer voice on the international stage. Now clearly we cannot uh, preempt the agreement which will be reached on these issues, but on that third of the tests, we have set out what we would like to see uh, an ambitious and purposeful package of new powers be for the Scottish Parliament. We have been clear that we want to have the ability to represent Scotland's interests internationally within the framework of our current responsibilities. We also expect to see new mechanisms that uh, give us a role and influence in UK foreign policy in areas where we are currently unable to contribute. The important point here is that we're looking for powers for a purpose. We want to reflect Scottish views of the world with the aim of improving lives of people in Scotland and contributing as a good global citizen. And the powers that we seek are consistent with those aims and are essential if we are to ensure that the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government can play a stronger role in decision-making issues which are affect our responsibilities. We are making the case that additional powers should include specific competence for Scotland to act directly in the European Union and internationally, to improve Scotland's sustainable economic performance, to maintain the integrity of Scottish government policy in our areas of responsibility, and to make a distinctive contribution to global challenges. And Scotland's relationship with the European Union is particularly important in this new debate. The EU exercises considerable influence over economic prosperity and social welfare, areas of policy that are either already the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament or expected to be transferred to Edinburgh through the Smith Commission. Our strong belief is that Scotland should have guaranteed rights to engage directly with EU institutions and EU decision-making processes in these areas. And a statutory mechanism should be put in place to enable Scotland to jointly develop, to influence, and represent UK policy positions on broader European matters, for example, on EU reform or treaty change. This development right which should would recognise the distinctive Scottish approach to the EU, about which I will say more later. Scotland 
world remains an outward facing nation, keen to share our talents, our goods, our ideas with those around the world. This has not changed because of the result of the 18th of September. The job of the Scottish Government now is to ensure that the expectations of early and substantial change that were raised during the referendum campaign are squarely met. This means transferring new powers and responsibilities to allow the Scottish Parliament and Government to tackle the challenges facing our nation. My government has very much welcomed the opportunity to put forward uh, these proposals. However, it isn't just politicians who are leading the way in creating a fairer, more prosperous Scotland with a stronger voice on the international stage. As I mentioned earlier, the level of engagement by the people of Scotland on, in the debate on our constitutional future was simply astounding. Before the referendum, 97% of those eligible to vote in Scotland registered to make their voice heard. On the day, as I said, turnout was 85%. And even now, we're beginning to see the referendum's legacy beginning to play out. Nowhere is this more dramatically illustrated than the increase in membership of the pro-independent political parties in Scotland. For example, on the 18th of September, membership of my political party, the Scottish National Party, stood at 25,000. <coughs> Today, less than a month later, membership stands at 80,000. The pro-independent Scottish Green Party has also recorded a dramatic growth in membership over the same period. Now, if I was to put that in uh, national UK terms, or, or in the terms of Italy, the current president of the Council of Europe, it would be equivalent to a membership of a political party of one million people. By comparison, in the UK, the Labour Party is the largest UK party and it has a membership of only 190,000. That gives you a sense that politics did not stop or stand still on the date of the referendum. Politics and the people are moving forward at pace and the political engagement is moving forward at pace. It is clear the debate in Scotland has re-energised our politics and in so doing challenged our politicians <coughs> to respond to the expectations and aspirations of our citizens. And my vision is to see this level of engagement not only in my own country but right across the EU. We saw in the European elections in May that only 42.5% of the electorate turned out to vote, a figure that was even lower in the United Kingdom at 35%. But the same 30 odd percent of people voted in the May elections, that transferred to 85% a few months later because the political engagement was more acute. We've also seen the rise, as was mentioned, of, in the UK of Eurosceptic Euro parties. And those of us who believe that the European Union is important, not in itself, but as an agent to deliver jobs, peace, prosperity, and social progress, need to take decisive action. That is why the Scottish Government has published an agenda uh, for EU reform with the fundamental aim of bringing Europe closer to the citizen. I have seen firsthand that levels of democratic engagement soar when people can see the relevance of policy to their own lives, and importantly when they feel they are being listened to. As such, the Scottish Government's focus in the EU will be to prioritise economic and social policies which reflect the fundamental aspirations and concerns of citizens right across Europe. This will involve renewing our collective endeavours to stimulate economic growth across the EU and enhance competitiveness. It means we have to tackle the high and <laughs> persistent level of unemployment across the EU, in particular the unacceptably high rate amongst young people. Not only is tackling unemployment desirable in itself, representing as it does a significant depletion of economic potential, it tackles inequalities across our societies, which undermines social cohesion and further jeopardizes sustainable growth over the long term. There is a shared endeavour for all of us. Jobs and fairness are in the mutual self-interest of all member states. And in addition, we have to redouble our efforts to address climate change and deliver energy security so that we and future generations can flourish in a safe and sustainable environment. In Scotland, we have already made good progress in these areas. For example, we're delivering on our commitment to provide more than 25,000 new modern apprenticeship opportunities each year for young people. And our Opportunities for All initiative offers learning or training opportunities 
for all 16 to 19 year olds in Scotland not already in work, education or training. On tackling climate change, renewable sources deliver just over 40% of Scotland's gro uh, gross electricity consumption in 2012, and that compares with an EU-wide figure of 23.5%. But we know we can achieve our goals in isolation. We recognise that issues such as climate change and use of unemployment in Europe, be it in Spain, France, Portugal, Greece, affect Scotland too. We also know that the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people in our society are still suffering from the devastating impact of the economic and financial crisis. The Scottish Government will work to urge the EU institutions to allow and indeed encourage member states to implement economic and domestic policies to support these citizens. After all, the EU is committed to building a social Europe in which poverty, inequality and ill health are combated. And my lesson is the language of that and the implementation of that is the fairness agenda I spoke about earlier. Again, the Scottish Government's commitment to tackling these difficult issues is borne out in our policies. For example, the Scottish Government has supported those on low incomes by introducing a requirement to pay a living wage in our public sector pay policy. Currently, £7.65 an hour or around £9.50. Euros. A living wage supports families' incomes, not only tackling poverty, but also helping people to buy local goods and services and supporting the local economy. And we are convinced that prioritisation of economic and social policies must go hand in hand with regulatory reform. Businesses too are still struggling to recover from the financial crisis and must be able to do so free from unnecessary financial and administrative burdens. And as such, we have set out five principles of better regulation in our reform agenda for the European Union. EU laws should be transparent, proportionate, consistent, targeted, and the institutions should be held to account where regulation is overly restrictive or onerous. And this approach of ensuring better regulation rather than less regulation for businesses contrasts with the UK government's approach of seeking to repeal EU legislation via an arbitrary one in, two out rule. We believe that the only way to effectively reform the EU is to look forward and to seek to do things in a more efficient and coherent manner. Furthermore, the Scottish Government does not agree with Prime Minister Cameron's assertions that our relationships with the EU should be renegotiated and enshrined within our reformed treaty. We wish to protect the integrity of the single market and the benefits we derive from it and consider that the existing EU treaty framework provides a suitable political and legal basis to effect the reforms that we are advocating. This is particularly the case given that the Commission has shown its willingness to engage in a constructive dialogue on reform via programmes such as Europe 2020 and Refit. The UK Prime Minister has also undertaken that if his party wins a majority in the next uh, UK general election to be held in May next year, that it will offer an in-out referendum on the UK's EU membership. Now, having gone through our referendum in Scotland, where all sides argued, <coughs> yes and no, that membership of the EU is important, the Scottish voice will be distinctive and experienced in any future in-out referendum, and it will be a voice which strongly advocates us remaining in the EU. Leaving the European Union would not only extinguish opportunities for Scotland to grow its economy and create jobs, it would limit our ability to work with our partners to address common challenges and importantly would deprive over 5 million people living and working in Scotland of the rights and protections afforded to them by EU law. Now, speaking of rights and protections, those of you with an interest in human rights law will have noted Mr Cameron's proposals for a future UK Conservative government to repeal the Human Rights Act 1998. This legislation uh, incorporates fundamental freedoms enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights into the domestic legal, legal order of the United Kingdom. Any attempt to amend or abridge the, these uh, is a matter of serious concern to my government and we will do everything within our power to ensure that human rights protections remain in place. Indeed, under the terms of the UK devolution settlement, the current uh, settlement, any attempt to repeal the Human Rights Act would require the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And given our long-standing opposition to the proposals to scrap it, we would, of course, invite the Scottish Parliament to refuse the consent for the repeal of the Human Rights Act. Throughout uh, the referendum debate, 
Uh, Scotland has set out our positive, progressive, pro-European stance, um, and it's important that that is recognised. And in drawing my remarks to conclusions, I, I will quote the words of President Barroso um, that uh, Scot the Scottish Government has, I quote, repeatedly reaffirmed its European commitment. The Italian Government, which I mentioned earlier, currently holds the Council Presidency, also in recent days has re reiterated its strong will to build uh, ever closer relationships with the Scottish Government at bilateral, European and international level. And as we embark on a new policy cycle in Brussels and near the UK general election, it is more important than ever that we continue to reaffirm our European commitment and to forge those strong bilateral links. So the Scottish Government will therefore continue to protect and promote the benefits of our EU membership and the wider protections of international law under the European Convention of Human Rights. We will seek to influence the UK Government and EU institutions to advocate meaningful reform in those areas in which things can be done better in Europe. And we'll continue to argue the case for extra powers for Scotland in the EU so that we have the leverage we need to protect Scotland's interests, making our distinctive pro-European voice heard loud and clear here in Brussels. And finally, I want to make this point. Connecting people, politics and power has never been more important than it is now, not just for Scotland, but across Europe. Thank you very much.